Hi everybody, welcome back to the morning mist above and beyond schizophrenia. Now, I made a message uh, or a video a little while ago titled Schizophrenia and the Power of Support. And in that video, I talked about how having a, a support network behind the individual uh, going through psychosis it's, is very important. And for me, my support was my family. And the most important piece or part of that family was my mother. And she was my advocate. Uh, she done so much for me and that gave me the opportunity to recover to the capacity that I am today. And uh, a lot of you have asked my mother to be on here and to give her take and her experience, which hopefully her, uh, her, her answers to the questions that will be posed to her will uh, be able to maybe bring some hope uh, to some of you who are who have loved ones going through psychosis. And uh, so hopefully that can help. And my wife, Elisa, is going to be here asking us some questions. And um, so, yeah, here's my mother. Hi. <laughs> Hi. All right. So let's roll. I'm Carmen, father's mom. Carmen. Yes. <laughs> my mom, Carmen. <laughs> All right, so our first question is, what were some of the first signs that there was something wrong with Paul that you can remember? Well, Paul had um, seen things, a lot of things, talking to himself and so forth. But when I really realized that Paul was sick, when we went on a trip to Jamaica, we went for a two week to Jamaica and Paul was totally, totally um, delusional. And uh, I had to hold him down, we to jump out of cars, and we we'll look in the mirror. Someone was there to get him, and I have to rebook my plane ticket to come back to Canada. Within three days, I was back in Canada. That was when I realized that he was really, really sick, and I had to get him back home to see medical doctor to see what was really going on with him because I just did not know what the problem was. I thought he was just maybe smoking weed and having reaction to it. I just didn't know the dimension of what he was going through. What was, the, what was that experience like for you? You're on this vacation in Jamaica and then realizing that he's, he's sick, having these delusions that you were talking about and having to rebook a trip to Canada in three days. What was that like? Horrible, frightening, scary, lot and lot of tears, not knowing what is going on with my son. He was just 19, what is going on? How am I gonna handle it? And I have to get him back home. And it was the most scary of things in my entire life that I've gone through to see how he was just completely out of his mind with delusions and someone chasing him. This one wanted to get him and even me, myself, he wanted to get him. He would look in the mirror. He and I was so terrified and I says to get him help, I have to get back home to Canada to see what was wrong with him. And that's what we did in three days. I could rearrange my ticket with him and we came back to Canada. So once you were back in Canada and you saw, saw the doctors and soon at some point they informed you that his diagnosis was schizophrenia, what were those emotions like? Did you even know what schizophrenia was before? Well, I don't did know what schizophrenia, I heard the name, but I've never because no one in my family has ever had mental illness. So I didn't know what it was about, but before I took part the doctor and I got home and he was really getting sicker and sicker and he was starting to fast. Mm -hmm. He started to fast and I says, why are you fasting? And he said, he has to fast for five days. They're going to eat, he go to 10 days, he go to 20 days, he go to 30 days, Paul fast for 40 days, 50 days without eating. And I said, what, well, this is not real. And then he started, when I really understand that he, my son was really sick, he was skinny, skinny, skinny. And one night he went in the garage and he locked himself in the garage. 
and I didn't know what to do and he was there screaming and praying so loud. So I called my friend whose daughter was a nurse at the hospital and uh, she says, well, what you have to do, you have to call the police, which I did. I called the police and that's how I first get Paul to the hospital so that he can, we can get some understanding of what was happening to him. Okay. So it seems like there was a period of um, time like when he came back from Jamaica and before he got to see the, the medical. Yes, the because doctor. he wouldn't go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. It was problem because he was 19. I couldn't get into the doctor and I would call the police. And the men, after I heard about the mental act, I would call the police and they would come and they would say, okay, we will take him to the hospital. And then, and, and then he come back home and then back and forth back and forth until we decided that i before i could get into the hospital after i got Paul into the hospital the doctor told us that he had paranoid schizophrenia okay so that was his official diagnosis that's what, and i didn't believe it with delusion of grandeur with delusion of grandeur which that was those words are new to me I never knew what they are, never in my life heard of that name before. And I said to the doctor, no, my son do not have schizophrenia. So I said, okay, we're going to go home because he's not schizophrenia. And we left and we went home. So what were the fears? You know, you heard that diagnosis and you didn't think that it was, it was schizophrenia. Like what were your, your thoughts on it? Like what did you think was happening? Schizophrenia. That was a really big name because I know just mad people have schizophrenia and we don't have that in our breed, mm -hmm. not in our family, not in our generation. We have never, never had that kind of mental illness. It was very new to me. I have to research it. My daughter and I, we researched what schizophrenia is and still, I did not believe it. I did not believe that my son, who is in school, educated, smart, going to school, have such illness as schizophrenia voices talking to him and it was the most scary thing because i myself did not believe the doctor that it was possible so definitely um do you did you feel that um like a like your own i guess the things in your in your family history and also maybe like culture played a, a role in when you heard that diagnosis and you just say, well, this is not, this is not possible. Of course, they, it, it plays a big role because when you don't hear of the thing, you see other people go through the, the family of mental illness. Then I ask, then I says, why would my child be going through this kind of thing? We don't have no history of it. Mm -hmm. So it was scary. It was new. It was something that I was really, really afraid of that what happening to him. And why him? Why him? Why not somebody that is a good kid, is doing everything that he is doing is good? Why my son? Why him have to have schizophrenia? And that was a very, very scary thing for me to believe in. So I denied myself that he has schizophrenia. Yeah, and yeah. then and sorry, and then there was uh the the thought that or the the, the the prognosis wasn't really good for, you know, there's no cure, you know. The prognosis, you know? yes. Because the doctor, when I talk with the doctor in the hospital, the doctor said there's no cure for it. And uh, he has to go on medication. And then I says he's not going to go on any medication because he's not sick. He don't have that prognosis. He don't have any mental illness. He just going to, he's going to go away. It's, and it never goes away. It gets worse. Mm -hmm. It get worse. And then when it got worse and worse, then I went back to the doctor and I start to believe that because I saw my son's deteriorating. He, he, he's not eating more. He's praying more. He's not talking to the family. He don't laugh anymore. He locked himself away. And it was, he threw up so many, he starved himself so much that he started to throw bile. And that was a scary part. He would throw up, he would throw up, and he would lock himself away. And I was so scared of my son. 
that I went back to the hospital to the doctor and it was hard to get into the doctor now because I couldn't force him and he knew that I couldn't force him and my son is smart and he tried to outsmart me so he wouldn't go to the doctor and a friend says to me you have to go and become his legal guardian I say, well, I am his mom. I am his guardian because he's an adult. I have to go and become his guard, legal guardian that I can get the help that he needs. And that's what I did. And so you talk about watching his mental state deteriorate over, you know, over a period of time. And that's what kind of like got you to, you know, come to that realization that something is wrong, maybe the doctors are correct um, with this with this diagnosis. What was that like? Was this still a bit of conflict in between? Like, is it really schizophrenia? But I see him deteriorating. Like, was there any? What was your well, emotions like? It was it was a roller coaster of emotion. It took it, it's a roller coaster for me and his siblings and his his, his cousin, so that it was hard. It was hard for us because we're his his support. We're always there for him. We're always there for Paul so that he knows we are there, even though he don't acknowledge we are there. But as soon as we, I acknowledge it and that he is sick and we go to, and, I've, and then I got to the, to the courthouse and I got to talk to the judge and they grant me his guardianship, which means I have a right now to call the police on the mental health act. I have the right to take him to the hospital. I have the right to do get medication for him. He has no right. I took away all his rights. And, and then that is a re, the only way I could go and get help for him. And then when I start to go to the hospital with him, he, I would put him to the hospital tonight. And tomorrow he talked himself right out of the hospital to the nurse. When I go look for him, he discharged himself and he was gone. And the next night, is the same thing over and over again for about three, four months that went on. And it was quite frustrating because I know he's sick, but his, his mental thing is he gets so smart with it that he can trick the doctors that he's okay. And my mom is the one who needs mental treatment because she's <laughs> sick, not me. And sometimes the doctor look at me at the hospital and think my son is right. I'm the one who's crazy and he's okay, even though they know that he's mentally ill and it's very, very difficult to get a mental health patient in the hospital to stay there because put them in today and tomorrow my son will be out of the hospital. And it was painful. Tear, lack of tears. It was very, very painful in those days. Yeah. So it seems you talked about becoming his legal guardian and having the mental health act, being able to apply for that. And you kind of feel like you had some sense of a little bit more of control. You could really get him the care that he needed. But on the flip side of that, when you got him the care that he needed, here he was discharging, foreign day. Yeah, discharging himself. And mm -hmm. you know, like, what is that like? Because you have these supports that are in place that are supposed to to help but at the same time it seems like they were also not helping very frustrating it was very very frustrating and i have to i fought with the nurses in the hospital i fought with the doctors in the hospital i get angry i have tears i cry a lot of times because there is your son your child you love to death and you cannot do nothing to help them and when you put them in a place that was there to help them the same place, turn them away. As soon as you leave, they turn them away. Very, very frustrating. Very, very painful. A lot of sleepless nights worrying if my son gonna live or gonna die. And no help. No help because the mental health system in the hospital is just no good. You have to be up and coming and be there all the time. I put my son in the hospital today and when I go tomorrow, the day after, they says, well, he signed himself out. No one will call mm -hmm. and says, we are going to let him out. And I worried when they let him out, did he find his way home? How did he get home? So all those were factoring in his psychosis. Yeah. And you kind of, you know, spoke to this a little bit. And 
you know, at any point, you know, you talk about that there was lots of frustration, you felt really scared, but at any point in this journey, did you ever feel any sense of hopelessness or even powerlessness along the way? I find I find I I found it powerless then when I did not have his when I was not becoming his um for being the guardian his guardian because that without being his guardian there's nothing you can do mm -hmm. and after I got his guardianship. Even though I have it, sometimes you feel powerless because when you put him in a, in a place to help him, they send him away over and over and over. I had to persistent there, persistent. And there's one time when my son had a real, real breakdown. And the hospital that we took him to all the time was filled up, no space, and they took him to a second hospital. And that was when the breakthrough came. Didn't know then, didn't know then, but afterward realized this was the blessing from God to this to send him to a different hospital. And that's where his journey of recovery, not right away, it took him 10 months in that hospital before he could leave for a while and become what he is today. When you when you meant you just mentioned um, breakthrough, can you you know tell us and to the viewers like what was that breakthrough like for you from the previous hospital that he would go to frequently and then now he was at this one like what was the difference? The difference was the doctor. We had a fantastic doctor at the second hospital, mental health doctor. Even though they had the same thing at the previous hospital, at this hospital, the doctor listens and cares. And that when you could talk to him and he understand what Paul was going through and he sat me down and he explained what this mental health schizophrenia is all about, what to expect, what not to expect, and the ups and downs of it. It wasn't easy, but then I was I have a little understanding more. And I also, and he encouraged me to join the schizophrenia society. Go there, listen to other people who are going to the same thing because you're not alone. There's so many people going through the thing alone and you have to go out there and find a community of people in this schizophrenia society and they help you to understand it. You have books, you have support and to help me to understand what this is and the ups and downs, the ups and downs. So this is what that doctor told me to do, gave me the address, the phone number of the Institute of Society, and that's what I did. So prior to you meeting this new doctor at this hospital, like no one ever sat down with you to kind of went through, you know, what the diagnosis was, what your expectations, maybe hear, you know, your feelings, your concerns about it, and kind of provide other supports in the community for you to reach, to reach out to? No, no. The doctors at the first hospital, says this is what he has schizophrenia or what the next one for delusional grandeur yeah. i don't know it's schizophrenia paranoid schizophrenia. Schizophrenia. With, with, with delusional grandeur i said what they, they told me like what is no one explained to me i said here are some pamphlets go look at this and go there to see what it's all about and educate yourself about it no they always say hey, he's gonna be in the hospital they're gonna medicate him and from here, if he has to take his medication, and that's it. There was no hope for him. No hope. He just, the only way is he's going to survive with what he is to have been on a medication for the rest of his life to calm his delusions. And that's what I really wouldn't accept. I wouldn't accept that because I know there has to be more out there of this illness. So when I went to the second hospital and met the second the second, no, he was about the, about the fourth doctor, when I went to the, the new hospital, I met this doctor and he was the one that 
was here, was there on Paul's part from the beginning until Paul was discharged from the hospital. What was that journey like? What that journey, that journey, that doctor was, it wasn't, it, it, it was good. I could talk to him, I could see him, but with Paul still in the hospital, the journey with him is good. To deal with his doctor and someone who understands is good, but the journey with Paul was just begun. It was hell. Literally, it was hard. A lot of tears. Me and his and his and his family uh, and his siblings. Lot of tears in the hospital. Seniors, my son. I no medication. He was and he was really really gonna die because he was still fasting. He wasn't eating. And then the doctor says we have to get him to eat something. And what kept you moving for each day? Well, I think faith, faith in God, faith in God, and you cannot give up. Faith in God and believe that my son may not be what he eventually become, but he will be someone that will be live at home with me. Will be, will love him. Will take care of him, and this is the best we could have done. But. In the hospital, the journey he went through, the journey was terrible. It was hard because, because Paul fasts a lot. He has to have food because if he don't have food, he would die. He was going to starve himself to death. And uh, the doctor suggested that we have to feed him with tube in his nose, which he reject completely. He would not have that because I don't want to eat. And because I am his legal guardian, I have the right to ask the doctor to talk to me and says, Carmen, this is what we have to do to save Paul's life. Paul reached the stage where he's not going to live if we don't put some food down in him. We have to put tube in his nose. And uh, that part ripped me apart. That was hard. As a mother, seeing your son, it's, it's very hard talking about it now, seeing that Paul is so good, but see my son, I they have to handcuff him on the bed, put him down, strap him by because I gave them the right to do it to save his life. And I love him so much that I want him to live. And to see them strapping my son down on the bed, with a handcuff, hold him down and put tube on his, in his nose for him to eat, for him to have life. It's something I wouldn't wish any mother to see her go through because up until this, when I think about it, it hurts so much because if I didn't give that permission, my son would die. He would starve to death. And I gave the permission for the doctor to tie them up, to put food, to put ensure in an IV for him to feed. And they tied him up maybe sometime for the day for him to get three meals. It was hard for me to go to the hospital and look at my son that way. It was hard for me not to say, lose him, take it there. But it was worse if I didn't do it. I know I would lose him and I love him too much to lose him. So I decided to go through the pain, the heartfelt pain, so that my son can live. And that's what I did.